Hello everyone, it's Dr. Durst and welcome to RMD, All Things Aesthetics and Wellness podcast. And I have a special guest with me. I have Faraday, my co-host, and then we have a special guest with us today, Dr. Jason Hall. I'm going to let them both say a few words. Sure. Well, I, Dr. Durst, I appreciate you having me here today. Um, mm -hmm. Really looking forward to getting into all things hormones and aesthetics. So this will be fun. We're so glad to have you. Yeah, well, thank you. And I'm a regular on here, so you guys all know me, but we're really excited to have Dr. Hall today and talk about all the things with plastic surgery and hormones and wherever else the topics may take us. So we're going to start today's podcast topic will really be, you know, surgery and hormones and how that might tie together and work um, in combination, you know, to get you lasting results and, and better outcomes and all of the things. And so as we have questions, we'll just go back and forth. And sure. And yeah, this will be fun. Yeah, it'll be fun. So we're going to start with like even, you know, I guess our patients being perimenopause and menopause age are frequently looking for surgical corrections of things that are um, happening. We do aesthetics, but obviously non-surgical options. And, and then, but they're of an age that they're going to actually need a little bit more at times. And so what do you think you see the most of in a perimenopause, menopause age in the office? It's a great question. So about two thirds of my practice is women who are perimenopausal or menopausal. Um, and in that age range, um, there really are like, all comers. We see a lot of breast and body surgery. Mm -hmm. So breast lifts, breast lifts with implants, abdominoplasty, um, and then facial surgery from eyebrows and eyelids to facelifts, neck lifts. Um, you know, with COVID and Zoom, the neck has become a real mm -hmm. focus. Oh, yeah, they don't um, like seeing that. No, no, nobody does. <laughs> nobody likes the Zoom neck. Well, Zoom can be kind of brutal, too, yeah. right? Yeah. Without yeah. a filter of some sort. Yes, yeah. exactly. A ring light. Yeah. <laughs> a ring light plus. Yeah. yeah. Um, but so, so that is the, you know, in that age range, it, uh, pretty it's much everything. top of the head to the bottom of the feet. It's everything. You know? And so that's a significant proportion, though, like not something that I knew necessarily, but mm -hmm. it's, it sounds like two thirds then mm -hmm. are of an age, an older age, because well, that gives us a lot of opportunity to talk about that age range and in different things we can do to optimize them, because we don't do a lot of younger patients. It's mainly as they start to notice some symptoms um, when they hit the 40. And we always say 40 to 55 is that perimenopause and perimenopause is no man's land. You know, yes. you don't really know what's going on. Um, your estrogen tends to be a little high, not really high, but looks high in comparison with progesterone and testosterone, which drop. And so they tend to be, you know, a little more emotional. They're starting to notice things that they might not have noticed before. They're looking in the mirror, seeing things and body composition changes. Yeah. yeah. Sleep starts to not be so good. Night sweats start to occur. So some of those hormonal changes, even mm -hmm. as early as 30 in some of our patients are yeah. starting to see those differences. Yeah. Out of the patients that you're seeing for surgery, about what percent do you see are on hormone therapy? Very, very few. Very actually. few. Okay. And this, so this is really, this is really exciting for me to be here and learn from the two of you because I, I do see, and we were talking before we got started, I do see a significant number of those perimenopausal and menopausal patients are on some sort of antidepressant, anti-anxiety mm -hmm. medication. And, you know, from your standpoint, where do those, those, those um, hormone deficiency symptoms start? And what are the kind of the most common things that you are seeing that you're treating? And so that's, that's a great question because... I didn't realize so many weren't on hormone replacement, and but I think it is an underserved. Like women and hormones, it's, they don't know really where to go. And so it brings up the, they've been to the gynecologist, they've been to the primary care physician, and basically it's an, you're aging. And so when you talk about medications, what's the first thing that happens when they go to the gynecologist or primary? They're not sleeping, so they get placed on sleep medicines. Sleeping medications. They're yeah. anxious, anti-anxiety, and they're a little depressed, so antidepressants. So we're not deficient in antidepressants or anti-anxiety medicines. We're deficient in progesterone. 
and you know, progesterone is our feel-good hormone, mm -hmm. and that's usually one of the first hormones that drop as we start going through perimenopause. Mm -hmm. So okay. a lot of times we can just replace progesterone if we're low and balance it with estrogen, and mm -hmm. we can see sleep improve, mood improve. Balancing that estrogen can make a huge difference in these women's lives. Yeah. And again, it's really that 40 to 55. So estrogen doesn't drop. It looks high comparison to, in comparison to progesterone and testosterone. And like Verde said, progesterone is your feel-good hormone. So you can't sleep. Now all of a sudden you're pissed off about everything. You know, just like that. And so <laughs> Little like, things set you, you know, off that never we, set you off no. before. And I think that to, meme the other day was hilarious. You're like, why is the floor on the damn floor? Yeah, like, yeah. All the little things make Anything you mad. Anything makes you mad. So like you, you I, we frequently hear, you know, we're, we're, I was laid back. And now all of a sudden I'm not laid back. So those are the most frequent things we see in perimenopause is um, I can't sleep. I'm anxious, you know, my mood is not the same. And that can be testosterone or progesterone, but test drops too. And so that life force for men and for women is testosterone. But it's really um, like almost a gender bias for women because mm -hmm. women and testosterone is unheard of. There's no FDA approved treatments for women and testosterone, but you can still do that. You're using bioidentical, you know, mm -hmm. which is different. So we're using maybe pellets or injectables to do testosterone, but Again, it brings us to improved healing with surgery. And then again, mood's better. They're sleeping better. Yeah. You know, the inflammation Energy is going to be better. Less, or energy, all that. So. Which is huge when you're looking at body composition changes, right? If I have yeah. the energy after work to go to the gym and work out and I'm able to build muscle because my testosterone is optimized, mm -hmm. I'm going to have better composition overall. I'm going to have a better workout. I'm going to have better recovery, less inflammation. And I'm just going to feel better overall. You know, as in medicine in general, you know, bleeding, like uterine bleeding is a big thing, fibroids. And so I worked at the ER for decades. And so people would come in in that perimenopause age and they have excessive bleeding, uterine bleeding. So they have ablations and hysterectomies and all of that endometriosis is more common. And really what they needed is progesterone optimization. You know, not necessarily a guarantee, but most of the time, if you have long enough period of time to oppose estrogen with progesterone, you might stop their bleeding. So we might have less surgical, you know, hysterectomies, fibroids, mm -hmm. all of that. So, so it's interesting because we don't learn that in traditional medicine. No, you don't learn anything about hormones in mm -hmm. traditional medicine. No, very, all. very. You you learn the pathways, how they're made, and Correct. how they help support pregnancy, and then that's pretty much it. Correct. Yeah. No, we don't learn anything. So you really have to branch off and learn just hormone replacement to be able to do it right. So I would prefer that people send them to somebody that has hormone replacement, you know, a specialty in it, because otherwise they get the wrong answers or the wrong approaches or, the or they get half estrogen. treatments. Yeah. yeah, we see that a lot. Half treatment. Well, and again, hot flashes and, and night sweats don't equal estrogen loss, but you all actually see them placed on estrogen first and they're already looking estrogen dominant. And so it makes it worse. So when you get the very emotional, you know, patient in that age range, it could be bad too. So it's just interesting that we never learn a thing about it. It, re it really is. And one of the things, you know, I came from a, from a general surgery background first. So before plastic surgery, went through the whole five-year torture that is oh, this yeah. general surgery yeah. residency. And so one of the things we start hearing about hormone replacement, one of the things that I immediately start thinking, and I know some of our colleagues in medicine start thinking about it. Probably you guess. Oh, yeah, probably guess, guess is, the, is the breast cancer yeah. correlation. And, you know, what does hormone replacement in a perimenopausal woman do to their breast cancer risk? Yeah. So w t help me with that one. All right. One well, that's interesting. And this is that's very a, common. Yeah. Yeah. It gets brought up often. Well, and I think it goes back to like, so the initial um, like big scare with that was like the World Health, Health Initiative study, which was like 1993 to 2002. And it had like 16,000 women in it. And so with that, it was actually ended early when they did to a combination therapy of estrogen and progestin. So to be clear, neither of those in the study were bioidentical, which is what we do now. But you know, even doctors don't understand bioidentical versus synthetic, synthetic. even to this day. And so I've been doing this for 12 years and it has not changed in traditional medicine. But so that study, everyone was on Primer and Provera. You remember that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, everyone was. So 
Provera is a synthetic progestin that is not bioidentical. And Premarin is an equine horse urine estrogen. So again, neither one of those are um, bioidentical, they're synthetic. So when they actually, they, they stopped it early for breast cancer, cardiovascular risk and stroke. And in the study, people um, on hormone replacement actually had less in the way of colon cancer and osteoporosis, but it was the other concerns. So when they actually looked at that later on, it wasn't actually even the Premarin arm, it was the Premarin and Provera, so the progestin was actually the one that caused more issues. But again, now we're using bioidentical, and so you're using a different form, and so it's not, it doesn't cause breast cancer, but it can cause a breast cancer, like an estrogen receptor positive breast cancer to grow if it's there. So screening mammograms are necessary once we reach menopause and are replacing mm -hmm. estrogen. We're not to a point where we're actually using estrogen and breast cancer or even breast cancer treatment survivor patients. So we're not doing that at all. But just like estrogen, you would think that if estrogen caused it, everyone when they're pregnant and younger would get breast cancer. But it's the same thing. If they get it, it's genetic predisposition. So if they get it, they block estrogen production. And so we won't place somebody on estrogen if they have it. So we do require screening mammograms, but it doesn't cause. And it's kind of similar to men. Like everyone made it seem like testosterone caused prostate cancer. There's a good book out called Testosterone for Life. And Morgan Fowler is a urologist from Harvard that wrote the book and basically has, you know, critically, Multiple studies, critically yeah. looked at all <laughs> the studies that suggested it. And it doesn't cause um, prostate cancer either, but it can cause it to grow if it's there. And so, yes, again, I think common sense would tell us it's not the case, you know, because if estrogen caused breast cancer or if testosterone caused prostate cancer, men and women would have it at a very young age, but it always happens at an older age. Right. So logically it made sense, but I think that huge study scared everyone. And at the time you were probably... I don't know at where the time you that were. Came in out, your... I was in. I was in finishing medical school. Yeah. So and, and everyone was being taken off of mm -hmm. hormones, and so, yeah. um, I mean, fifty percent of people were taken off hormones with that. But then after they evaluated later on, it really was the progestin part, and now anything related to bioidentical has no correlation with breast cancer at okay. all. That's that's another question that I have is you know in doing some preparatory work for mm -hmm. this is that the bioidentical designation is is tossed around a lot. And it's not something that I, until I started reading about it, understood. And I think a lot of patients, certainly mm -hmm. if, if I start recommending, you know, if and when I start recommending patients mm -hmm. seeing somebody for hormone replacement, what is that bioidentical designation actually mean? so it's actually very interesting because it is yeah. like it's a term that i think it's even interchanged so much in medicine inappropriately mm -hmm. and yeah. i think it is a key word that has become a little popular you know like it's a fad this bioidentical but really when we look at bioidentical hormones the body is recognizing it as an, as its own and utilizing it as its own instead of seeing that synthetic arm so it is a big difference between pharmaceutical companies making a chemical compound to try to mimic the body versus taking something natural like from yams and having the same components the body can actually see it and utilize it as if it is our own production and Again, so they're synthetic in that they're made and not obtained from someone. So I think that's one of the big confusing points because it's still made, but it's identical to the body's own hormone. So estradiol is the one we're replacing. So there's three estrogens, you know, estriol, estradiol, and um, estrone. And estrone. So estrone is a very weak one. Nobody uses, but it's postmenopausal and weak. Estradiol is the one that's premenopausal and strong and preventative. So preventative for bone, brain, heart stuff, but it's E2, estradiol. It's identical to the estradiol that we produce in our body. So for simplicity terms, no matter what term is used, I think there's other things like bioidentical, bio, bio, um, like um, organic, like there's all kinds of different terms, but we're measuring hormones before, we're replacing and we're measuring after. So 
a drug or Primarin, for instance, which was a synthetic, we could not test in the blood. So we can do an E2 level baseline, treat, and then do an E2 level and see where we're at. So it's identical to the E2 of the body. And progesterone bioidentical micronized is also identical to progesterone. So they don't add like a small chemical component that's close and mimics, but it's identical. So the testing that you're doing is very similar to, say, testing vitamin levels. Mm -hmm. If you like vitamin D has been all over the news in the last couple of years, mm -hmm. you you replace vitamin D with vi vitamin D3 with vitamin D3. And then you check vitamin D3 la later and Correct. see where you are. Correct. Like that's a perfect way exactly. to, to, I think, make it simple for people to understand because there's lots of terms used. And I think the synthetic component, the fact that it is synthetic, so there are like stem cells or exosomes and things that are obtained from live births and used. This is not. And so I think the fact that it's made from something confuses people, but it's identical. Mm. And you're right. It's just like vitamins. If they get vitamins at the vitamin store, they're identical, Yeah. you know, and they're made, but you can test them and get levels. Yes. And in my, I, I think I heard you, you, you tried to, I think you tried to slip something in there made from <laughs> lambs. So the, oh, these are all, yeah. these are all plant-based. A lot of times. For the, yeah. for the, for the most yeah. part. Okay. Absolutely. That's, that's totally cool. Yeah. 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 And I think that versus taking from horses, horse yes. urine. which you yeah. should not yeah. be doing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> and then I think that for patients, they very much understand we're testing, we're replacing, we're testing. Mm -hmm. You know, so we're going to know what your level is. There's lots of things r thrown around and we won't get much into it, but like you can do salivary testing versus blood, but blood is very easily recognized by physicians. You can communicate with other physicians. And so salivary tends to be more of like either an academic term used or people that can't actually order, like providers that can't order blood, you mm -hmm. know, testing. So they'll do salivary mm -hmm. testing. So. And, and like Dr. Gere said, it's harder when you're working in a community with multiple physicians, right? We want a good relationship with primary. We want a good relationship with endocrine, with the urologist. So blood serum is universal. Mm -hmm. Everybody understands it. Mm -hmm. yeah. The test in front of me, you're going to understand that test in front of you. The salivary testing is very complex sometimes. And you look at it and you're like, okay, the measurement is way different. The ranges are way different. So they're not as universally yeah. understood. So it makes it a little bit harder when we're partnering. In our very, community. very hard. Interesting. Like even after 12 years of doing this. I've <laughs> still. So, yeah. I'm still thinking about it. I'm still, 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 still learning, the, learning yeah. the, the salivary uh, testing yeah. part of it. Yeah. Yeah, so, that's yeah. that's not a part of the, the practice that, that we do at no. all. So. No. So it's, it's good. Like blood and communication. And again, you know, finding surgeons, urologists, GYN docs that are like not going to scare patients too, you know, because some of them don't understand, but it's better to not understand and refer on than to scare. So we have some primary care doctors that'll be like, again, I thought maybe you were going to say clots mm -hmm. because that's the second thing. Yeah. And yeah. I'm sure that that comes up all the time. That was, you. that was with surgery. That was going to be my next that question. Was your, yes. I knew we were going there, <laughs> yeah. right? All I right. knew it was like yeah. breast cancer or clot. I wasn't yeah. sure which one was coming yeah. first. Well, you, but you, we knew you they were tried. both coming. Yeah. 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 You, you were expecting them both. Yeah. Well, and with you, like with breast surgeries, this is actually a good question for us to know is, is screening mammograms and like breast surgery or if they're on hormones because not many of your patients are on hormones mm -hmm. but do you mm -hmm. is a screening mammogram required for like a breast surgery it is if you are over 40 or are high risk i i tend to use the the current um breast society guidelines to to drive that um so and in, in we've had women i had a lady um very nice lady was coming in for breast surgery about six months ago um, and hadn't been screened. She was in her mid forties mm -hmm. um, and we ended up finding a breast tumor on, okay. a, on a screening, asymptomatic mm -hmm. on a screening mammogram mm -hmm. and had to delay her surgery so that she could have her breast cancer treated. Okay. Um, and so it's with, with specializing in surgery, nobody really needs that mm -hmm. they want. Yes. Um, it's those, those kind of safety measures are really important that, 
you know, we'll, we can talk about clots and risk assessment for mm-hmm. that and, and anticoagulation, but all of that stuff is really important. So yeah. long, long answer to what should have been, yeah. what's a short question is, yeah, the, the screening mammogram for the over 40 or high risk population. So is, based on like pretty mm-hmm. standardized based on guidelines. Mm-hmm. Then we, what about your patients that are on hormones? Do you have them hold their hormones or stop their hormones pre-surgery? That really, that's a great question. And I don't have a good answer for you because the number of patients who are on bioidentical hormones before surgery is so low. I have to actually go look up recommendations every time I see one. Okay. So it's a, it's a very, and I, I would love to get y'all's input on how to make that more, process yeah. more, um, you know, data driven and safe for those patients. What should we do? That's Absolutely. actually interesting because yeah. yeah. we we did a lot of look looking into that even prior to this podcast, kind of to see if there's like any good science studies that have solid recommendations. And there's not a lot out there, mm-hmm. I will say. And like one said, like I think 42% of like bioidentical companies would recommend stopping that four weeks to three months before. And I think that's probably a common time frame that you've heard. Or four and to then, six weeks. Yeah, and then it was like a 24% a mm-hmm. of synthetic or OCPs, like birth control, mm-hmm. um, that same time frame, but only like 3% of surgeons doing it. Yeah. And that was about the most solid study we found. But having said that, like estrogen is the hormone you're concerned with when it comes to clots. Progesterone and testosterone have nothing to do with it. You probably won't have many patients on testosterone because... It's not commonly used with women, and I'm assuming that the practice is mainly women. Probably a small yeah, amount but, of men, but, but, but yeah. About 98% yeah, I was women. Gonna say, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I was to guess that it was mainly, and so testosterone isn't used a ton with women, and we'll talk about that because it should be. It's awesome for yeah. healing purposes, but um, estrogen's the only one. So if anything is given orally, I'll just make it simple from my standpoint, and I couldn't find anything to back it up or not to back it up is oral estrogen goes to the liver, increases clotting factors, and increases your risk. So birth control, oral estrogen, estradiol, which is a manufactured brand that the primary doctors are more likely to use than us. And GYN. And we Mm -hmm. never use oral, ever, because oral estrogen, Mm -hmm. because it increases clotting and clotting factors. So ours is all either transdermal or pellet. Okay. And so I think if you're looking at bioidentical transdermal or pellets, you don't need to stop it. And if you're looking at oral estrogens, then it sounds like there's some guidelines out there and it's like four weeks to three months, mm-hmm. but no one's really and, you routinely following them. And we were seeing a lot online where it was saying um, when we were looking, trying to find solid studies, that if it's transdermal estrogen, you don't have to stop it. Mm-hmm. So gel, spray, patch, no need, just oral. Mm-hmm. So it's, Like Dr. Durst said, it's very swayed. You know, it's kind of for every three studies we could find one way, we could find three on the other hand as well. But there was across the board, micronized progesterone, no need to stop, no worry about any clotting. And then with testosterone, as long as we're watching hemoglobin hematocrit and Mm -hmm. blood levels are normalized, Mm -hmm. there's no reason to come off. Yeah. Yeah. And and with, with us, you know, for anybody who's actually having surgery, you know, we use a clotting risk assessment before that's a standardized gotcha. you know, okay. a standardized protocol with that assigns point values to every single one of those things and you know oral contraception oral hormone replacement is one of the line items okay. on there and once you get to a certain point it kind of tips you over into a a risk category that you need um, IV or subcutaneous anticoagulation before surgery to prevent those clots because those clots are going to form in, you know, essentially on induction of anesthesia Mm -hmm. um, is when you're going to get that clot started. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, other things, the the way we provide anesthesia, the level of relaxation that the patient has, and then they're, you know, them laying around after surgery, all, Mm -hmm. all of those things kind of affect that Yes. Clotting I, pathway. I love scoring <clears throat> systems for that reason. Yeah. That, you know, yeah. kind of lays awesome. it out and, yeah. and it makes it Very more objective. standard. Every, and, yeah. Everybody can yeah. do it. Very everybody easy. can score it. Yeah, you just got to go down. But yeah. And I think that that makes sense that if oral 
you know, estrogens or birth control are on there. That would make sense completely. Especially with clotting factor history, family Mm -hmm. history, if you had a previous clot, things like that, that make you at high risk, of course, it makes sense to hold. And again, for us, even treating um, patients with clotting history, you know, it comes down to, because they come into us the same way, Mm -hmm. I have a clotting history, I can't be on it, which isn't necessarily true, but it depends on, you know, if it's a DVT post flight, flight, you know, you're on an airplane, then there's a risk factor. And if we didn't use oral, you could. So it just depends. So same thing, you know, that risk stratification with it. But we could go on forever about hormones and surgery and effects. So I think what's interesting to me is to see if you have a difference or have noticed, observed a difference in women of different ages. And again, because most of the patients are women, um, not that I was, you know, just pointing out women, but um, in healing times after surgery, like do younger do better? Do older um, tend to have more complications? What or just comorbidities. Yeah. yeah. So it's an interesting question. I actually just um, was just talking about this the other day, that in cosmetic plastic surgery, age really isn't a factor as much as, or chronological age. So how, how many years, you know, for those of you, how many years old you are, is less of a factor than physically how old you are. Mm -hmm. And when, with what I do, most of that is soft tissue. Is, you know, just for example, when talking about breast surgery, is the breast tissue dense and firm like a youthful breast or has it been, Mm -hmm. has it atrophied and gotten replaced with fatty tissue, which is, you know, less, Mm -hmm. um, has less, Less pliability to it, less yeah. Firm, less elasticity. <laughs> you know, the, that, yeah. the ligaments that support the breast stretch out with pregnancy, and mm-hmm. it, can those still support a breast? What's is the skin thin with stretch marks, or is it nice and thick and elastic? Mm-hmm. And that's where I, I'm interested to hear from you is how hormone replacement can help that, can because help. certainly with thin tissue, with atrophic breast tissue, with stretched out suspensory ligaments. You know, that breast lift with implants isn't going to be as durable as it is if that tissue is really healthy. Supple. Yeah. Yeah. When I think when it comes down to like hormone optimization, it's cell health. And so even what you're talking about is just how healthy is that cell. And so, you know, collagen and elastin are like a huge component in a lot of skin aging or soft tissue aging because we're talking about both. Um, Again, Biologic age, skin aging. So if they're down, I always say like if they're going to lose one percent of collagen a year. So if some like that's a gross, you know, estimate. So if somebody comes in at fifty, and they've done nothing to stimulate collagen, they're fifty percent down. And so it's easy to talk to them about ways to stimulate collagen elastin in addition to just like I want Botox, I want fillers, because we can control movement, right? We can fill a little bit, but you're not going to get everything that you want in just filling and Botox. You can at 20, you know, 30, but not once we're older, right? Yeah. And so I think that when we talk about effects of hormones on collagen production, there's lots of stuff there. Testosterone's got a huge, you know, amount of literature on healing and even collagen production and tensile strength of collagen once it's there. You know, estrogen, Estrogen is a huge one. There was just an article in Dermatology Times talking about as estrogen starts to deplete, we start losing that collagen. We start having Mm -hmm. those histological changes in the skin. Mm -hmm. We see IGF-1 go down. I mean, it's pretty interesting that we can see that how much of a big effect estrogen can have in overall skin health and starting estrogen in women when they need versus waiting until they're 10 years Mm postmenopausal, starting when they're losing that estrogen, helping that skin stay supple. preventing those changes. Mm-hmm. So well, and not just skin, right? Soft tissue is what you're talking exactly. about. So everybody thinks of skin and so that's just a very superficial aspect of it. But fat per you know fat, fat perfusion is like a huge thing with estrogen. So mm-hmm. just getting healthier fat if there is, you know, such a thing, which there is. Oh, yeah, like there's a, a a level of subcutaneous fat that is needed. And again beyond that, it becomes less of just a storage unit and more of an endocrine. So you get negative effects if you get too much. So obesity and body contouring and liposuction has great endocrine effects on the body too, because now you don't have fat producing bad things because you've taken some of the fat out. 
And then I think their mood also improves, so they're also motivated. But again, fat um, effects of estrogen matter too, because you're going to have healthier fat. Mm -hmm. So in the breast tissue, that's one thing. And then test is another one. Progesterone has a little bit, but less in the way of skin and soft tissue and muscle in healing and anti-inflammatory effects as estrogen and testosterone do. So now help me out because I, you know, I do a lot of, you know, about half of my practice is facial surgery. Mm -hmm. And in that, a lot of patients come in and want to know how to improve their skin, lines and wrinkles, texture, and I end up recommending for a lot of those patients some form of laser resurfacing. Absolutely. It's and great. There is, you know, there are, are kind of old reports about estrogen replacement and, and skin healing. How can I help those patients? And have you seen patients who have gotten better results from resurfacing procedures that are on testosterone replacement versus patients who are not? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I always, say, I always say, like, again, I mean, to me, it's all about, like, behind the scenes, too. Yeah. So, like, we're doing a lot of stuff to treat something we're seeing. So, as we age, we all notice things in the mirror that we don't want to see, yeah. we didn't see before. And I think one thing leads to another. So, you correct one, you see something different. I mean, women you don't are, want to chase lines. We tell yeah, women yeah. that all the time. Yeah. Do right. not chase the lines. Yeah, with filler. <laughs> with filler. Like, so, yeah. <laughs> you know, that doesn't make any sense, right? So we're just filling a line, but you're not getting at the underlying cause. So I think laser resurfacing, number one, is an awesome, like, addition to everything else. So you can, that's a finishing, right? You're finishing, like, you're making everything thicker, the entire skin surface thicker, depending on what laser yeah. you're using. And, um, and, but then behind the scenes is the cell health. So like, I think if you're perimenopause and you're menopausal, you're not going to get sustained results unless your cell is completely healthy. So your, your nutrition's good. Your sleep is good. You know, your you're not dehydrated. Your biological <laughs> skin <laughs> health is, is, is younger, you know, so already you're going to get better results. But estrogen, like again, that glow of pregnancy, the vascular, you know, supply to the skin is huge. And so that's why we start to lose elasticity and collagen as we get older, because the estrogen, you know, and the blood flow to the skin is less, but testosterone has a huge effect on that too. You know, just mm -hmm. you're supporting bone growth because facial aging, you know, more than us, yeah. and we would love to hear more about it. You know, the fat pads and bone, you know, they get less support, mm -hmm. which is one of the reasons why you get all the sagging. Yeah. And with and decreased estrogen issues. and testosterone, yeah. you lose bone. Yeah. So what do you notice with that? Like, and I think that like our ladies would love to hear more of that, the change in the facial structure as they age related to, you know, bone or fat pads. Sure. Yeah. There, there, there have been, um, and I, I talk about this almost every consultation that the face ages in a relatively predictable way. You know, we all experience the same changes over time. Um, the interesting thing is that I've never really thought to link that to hormone fluctuations versus mm -hmm. just time, but I, mm -hmm. I, the two probably go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. um, and most notably in women, you'd kind of mentioned bone aging. Um, we all lose volume in our facial skeleton over time, which contributes to the hollow eyes, the under eye bags, Thinning jowling, yeah. you know, the, the, both jowling in the front, loss of the kind of the angle of your mandible, because the bony skeleton actually recedes around the eye sockets, recedes around the jaw. And people talk about their nose getting bigger over time. Mm. That's actually from the skeleton For getting second. smaller. Yep. Is, mm -hmm. is the nose doesn't actually change, the skeleton gets smaller. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of, you know, we can't really do a whole lot about bone replacement. So we end up camouflaging that with either deep soft tissue fillers, which can offer modest improvement mm -hmm. in that early patient with those early signs mm -hmm. of aging, and then your own body fat, um, doing actually taking fat, fat graft, doing actually. fat grafting, taking fat with syringe liposuction, processing that out very similar to, you know, we had talked about stem cells earlier, mm -hmm. very similar to some of the processing that's done for that and then re-injecting those into those areas. Um, 
the an interesting thing about that is that there was some work that just came out of San Diego earlier this year that showed that there's a cutoff at about 55 years old. And if you're younger than 55, and this is these are patients that are primarily women, if you're younger than 55, you have about an 80 to 90 percent take. So 80 to 90 mm-hmm. percent of what we inject stays at a year and a half. If you're over 55, that number drops to 50% or less. Have you ever that's looked at PRP addition to like some of the fat? Because I know that's mm-hmm. a new kind of area yeah. mm-hmm. that is intriguing. I've just touched on like a couple. And a lot of times it's our patients bringing something to us. Mm-hmm. Like because we do PRP, but don't do mm-hmm. fat transfers. So yeah. they'll come to us and ask. And so I've just briefly looked at. That's- yeah. And it's something that has started to kind of catch on. In, in the plastic surgery world, but right now, looking at the data, the take is not astronomically different. You okay. get a little bit more, but not. it's not the difference between 30% take and 90% You're not take. taking okay. your 55-year-olds, and now they're all responding. And now they're right. not all right. getting 90%. Right. It's not that. Un- <laughs> unfortunately, not yet. Yeah. Not yeah. yet. You're not improving it to, yeah, 95 with with that age, uh, that age uh, group. But anyhow, I think that... It's interesting that you say, so what I'm hearing, again, obviously the bone decreases, you can't do anything about that. Mm -hmm. So you have skeleton shrinkage with time. Mm -hmm. And so everything starts to sag, you know, and the gravity is, you know, is pulling it down. You can't do anything about that, um, you know, surgically, uh, but fat you can. So you can take it from somewhere else Mm -hmm. because that's something that's also um, getting heavier with time, moves to the lower face, away from that phase and are you usually pairing that at the same time you're doing deep dermal are they two separate just out of curiosity because we have patients that are we're realistic with our patients we have women yeah. sometimes that come in and they're like i want this and i'm like well that's a facelift yeah yes. that, yeah we're, you're not going to get that from filler you're not going anyway, to get that from threads yeah. you're not going to get that from laser resurfacing or microneedling it's just not realistic mm-hmm. so they'll ask you know well what does that look like you know, mm-hmm. so out of curiosity, do you do them at the same time? Are you doing dermal fillers and also fat transfers, that that grafting or? It, with with that, I'm doing pretty much either or. Okay. Um, the, and the, the conversation in my office is, that, you know, we talk about, and I've talked about this on, on a podcast episode in the past, is that there are really three different areas of facial aging that you have to address to get a comprehensive treatment. You've got to address the skin. You've got to address the volume loss. And we got, I got kind of carried away with the bony part and forgot about the fat pads. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, you know, the, your facial, you've got a bunch of little facial fat compartments mm-hmm. that all lose, most of them lose volume over time. Some of them, kind of the ones right around your nasal area crease, tend, <laughs> tend, tend, to, tend to grow, which we yes. don't want. Um, but trying to refill some of those areas with either filler or fat is one of the one of the pillars of facial aging that we try and reverse. You can do some of that with fillers, mm-hmm. but the the cost lines tend to cross fairly soon. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're talking about, you know, eight, nine, ten syringes of filler mm-hmm. to hit all of these different areas mm-hmm. versus a single session of fat grafting with the possibility of coming back at a year and adding a little bit more to select areas. Um, and then that, that third part of the, the kind of the facial aging triad is the, is the structural part, kind of the part that gravity takes over mm-hmm. the bone, um, all of the muscles supporting your face and that, you know, facelift surgery, necklace surgery is really muscle tightening. There's, there's no, the skin kind of comes along for the ride. Um, And so that part of it is, is where, and once you start seeing jowling, um, once you start seeing neck laxity, you know, those are things that you may get a very, very slight improvement with revolumizing, but without looking alien, it's yeah. tough to fix that. <laughs> yes. And, and we have those conversations a lot in this office too oh, yeah. about yeah. that, you know, we yeah. don't do overdone. Yeah. Well, and I think that again, filler gets a bad rap for that reason, because you're trying to do it beyond the point where you need to. Mm-hmm. And so they're not very realistic. And so we have that because people don't want filler at all. But you're like, what do you mean? Like you're at a point, because yeah. I almost look at it as like a firm fill and finish. Like 
that firming is what you're talking about, like where they need left. Mm -hmm. And so you need more. You can fill and do some volume replacement, and then you can finish with all the, you know, Botox and laser Lasers. resurfacing and all that. But again, it looks abnormal and gets a bad rap because people are overdoing it, trying to fix everything. And that's mm -hmm. impossible. And then you're going to distort movement. You're going to look abnormal. Alien is a good term. Alien is yeah. a really good yeah. term. Yeah. Yeah. I that's like that. That's a good that. term. So, yeah. You know, the, and the, the, you don't want to, don't want to hit the, uh, hit the injectable companies too hard, but they've developed some of these stronger fillers. Your, your, um, Voluma. Some of these, some of these fillers that are really stiff, and they say, "Well, this will give you a lot of lift if you just put it all up in here. Mm -hmm. You can get rid of that jowl." And so you start seeing people that are whose faces are either totally square or they've got these very exaggerated the cheekbones. Cheeks are quite they're, impressive. Their yes. their jowls, their jowls have gotten a little better. So, well, yeah, I mean, it's fixed lifted. the jowls a little better. Yeah. Yeah. You've lifted everything. Yeah. You've lifted everything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but if you look at, so I've seen a couple, and I should have brought a um, filler on. But if you squeeze it out, like, so for the G prime, you know, all of that, like, again, if I squeeze it onto my finger and press down, it's going to move. Yeah. You know, so it's not like it's as firm as they try to make it seem. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to still make it move. And so... It's not a correction. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I like using those. Uh, not, mm -hmm. not to yeah. not to throw those those guys under the bus. Those I think those stiffer fillers have a good have mm -hmm. a role in in facial rejuvenation. Absolutely. I yeah. like using them to contour the areas of bone loss, mm -hmm. and then Absolutely. use some of those softer mm -hmm. fillers to go in and fill fat pads and and try and yes. you know I like your I like your firm fill and finish. Is is there yeah. If they start talking about, you know, lifting in some way, <clears throat> then it's different. But you can volume loss and, you yeah. know, and fill and you can finishing. Everyone needs. Yeah. So we have those That's that laser yeah. Yeah. resurfacing you were talking about. Yeah. Everybody benefits from yeah. that. Yeah. Young to old. Yeah. Yeah. And laser resurfacing is the key to that. Like completely. 100%. Yeah. And again, it depends on which one. And it depends on downtime and what they want. But still. You got to have laser resurfacing as well. Oh, I, I couldn't agree. It, yeah. it has it has become over time has become one of my favorite mm -hmm. facial mm -hmm. rejuvenation mm -hmm. uh, modalities. It's just finding the person that is that the patient that matching the patient to the result to the downtime. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And we have that again. We don't. We just don't talk about resurfacing enough. And I love lasers for that reason because you can do so much with them, and you still need that. Because that's yeah. your finishing. Mm -hmm. Like your finishing touches, you still don't want wrinkles and you want thick skin and you want it to look healthy and vibrant. And so we tell our patients you should be doing something every month. Every yeah. month. Every month. So we do memberships for laser resurfacing for our patients. Um, and that they love. They get to come in once a month and they've got a variety of things they can choose from. And it makes a huge difference overall. Mm -hmm. what, what, what do you like? What's your favorite? For laser resurfacing? Oh, right now, mine's yeah. the triple glow, which is um, where we'll dermaplane, do a hydrofacial, and then we use the Lutronic um, Ultra Glow just over. So it kind of, it does a little bit of everything. Cleans out the pores. It makes me not fuzzy. And then just that light few top layers of skin off. I just, a huge, huge, huge difference in my skin since I've been doing that. So I think that that's a good like maintenance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a good maintenance Pores. one, but you're not going to really yeah. treat. And I look at them as different. So you're yeah. treating or you're just maintaining or mm -hmm. preventing. Yeah. And so that's a prevention one. So on a monthly basis, it's almost this prevention. Like you need to do something once a month. But so when it comes to like treatment in here, we do one of two mainly. And we don't do, we have like, we don't have a CO2, but we have an erbium that can go superficial or deep. So depending mm -hmm. on their downtime, it also does like a 4D, what we call 4D non-surgical facelift mm -hmm. because it's, we go into the mouth with it. It's a different type of laser. Oh, wow. um, and Fritona is the name of the laser, which is mm -hmm. like one of my favorites. It's a beast um, of a machine. A but you can go in the mouth and do deep dermal where, you know, all therapy before you couldn't yeah. get as deep. So at least you can thicken everything. So you can go in the mouth. You know, so you're getting the nasal labial folds around the mouth and wow. then you come to the outside for two other steps for a mid and upper dermis and then resurfacing. And that resurfacing is an erbium 
that usually is ablative, but you can actually do it in non-ablative mode, or you can take it really deep with downtime. Not probably quite the results that you would get with CO2, but we could, but none of our patients want. They're not coming to us because they are looking for downtime, really. Mm -hmm. So I think if they're looking for surgery or they're looking for you know, something more aggressive, like a one time, maybe a two time, but usually one time, because CO2, is that one of your favorites? So or? I have a I have an Irby um, Okay. So sure. it, it is, it's interesting because we have an attachment that does the a combination fractional ablative and deeper non-ablative, but then most of the most of that, you know, device is ablative, okay, either fractional okay. or full field. Okay. Um, so. I want to get back to what you were saying about the the photona, that was that like in the mouth is kind of cool that so that's a non ablative. So <laughs> it's very laser. interesting. So what you're saying too, even with this final step. So photona has two wavelengths. So it's a twenty nine forty rpm, okay. and then it's a ten sixty four. Okay. NDAG, and mm -hmm. so. The first one is erbium, but it's mm. an erbium with a long pulse wave. So like with or with a long wavelength. And mm. so with that, you can get deep, but not ablative. So you can heat. So you can go in the mm. mouth and obviously erbium is attracted to water. So you can basically laser inside the mouth and get deeper to thicken the deep dermal. The outside next two steps are actually in DAG. And so you get a little deeper, a little more superficial with almost something similar to your frac, but in DIAG mm -hmm. targets pigment. Yeah. And so you really don't want to do that with men, but then you come to the last step and it's erbium again. So you can do, you know, your deeper non-ablative, mm -hmm. you can do fractional full, you know, full, um, full field if you wanted to. So it depends on their downtime. So yeah. you can go deep and, but the nice thing about this one is like you can dial it deeper or more superficial in any of the modes, but it does like 170 other treatments. So mm -hmm. we can do vaginal rejuvenation. We do like a 4V vaginal facelift, like with the laser. So similar to the face, but on mm -hmm. the vagina, on the outside for, so with some pretty amazing results. For somebody, oh, absolutely. Just, you for somebody that isn't like a surgical <laughs> yeah. candidate, yeah. you know, but didn't even think about making it prettier, but they can make it prettier. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's, that, that's <laughs> actually, you, you, you jumped the, you, you jumped me there on that <laughs> yeah. one because I was going to ask you about that because we were, when we were walking through earlier, um, you had talked about the, the vaginal rejuvenation laser, and that's not something that I do. And we've, I, I think we've all seen an uptick in mm. cosmetic oh, general procedures in the last couple of years, you know, labiaplasty has become a really popular surgical procedure, but the non-surgical vaginal rejuvenation is not something that I have a whole lot of familiarity with other than the devices are out there. So educate me on what that is. It is unbelievable. When these ladies came back last year from Texas and were like, we can do a 4D on the vagina. I was like, what? Uh -huh. I'm like, no way. Yeah. <laughs> and our first patient that jumped on the table, we were blown away. Just one treatment, the tightening external that we saw was yeah. just remarkable. Mm -hmm. She came back seven, eight months later and there was no change, no laxity. She wow. was just as firm as she was when she left after that first treatment. And usually we're doing about three of them because mm -hmm. we want to maintain, but it has it is unbelievable the changes that we're seeing. Um, we had a patient recently that came in um, that has done labiaplasty before and is still seeing some changes now a few years mm -hmm. later. And we're trying to target some of those areas and we're being able to correct that laxity and just it's blown me away. So most of them are like non-surgical candidates for the outside. So they're not even really thinking about it necessarily. And, mm -hmm. to, and we didn't even think about it. Like, honestly, I did ER for decades. I tell this story all the time pelvic exams nonstop, right? Never looked at a vagina and thought that needs to be prettier. I just thought right. that needs to be like, they're all different. Right? They're all different. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. it. And so the first one we did last year, I was shocked at the results. She was like pacing in front hour. of my door, waiting for me to yeah. come out just yeah. to show me the picture. Yeah. So it's pretty amazing. <laughs> we'll show you that. At, um, but then the inside though, so those are all non-surgical. And I think we're bringing that to to light just because people are more aware. So if we're talking to them about internal vaginal rejuvenation, then we're naturally just talking to them about external, but they're not anyone that's ever been told they needed a labiaplasty. I mean, those patients that come to you for labiaplasty are probably 
told and directed, you know, to come in because the gynecologist or someone else, it's not usually the patients, is it, that has noticed a big change? Or they have like pinching, right? Yeah. Just excessive skin. Yeah. So it, we're it, not seeing those patients. Yeah, it's it's the um, yoga pants, tight swimsuits, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and oh. that Instagram and the internet, um, not a lot, uh, surprisingly not a lot of physician referrals. For that it's okay. a it's a lot of self referral. Well, I wonder. I just saw that article right. about the yoga pants, and one physician had like a crazy increase in well, yeah. doubled, thanks to yeah, late, double to the yoga plastic. pants yeah. in twenty twenty two. They touched yeah. that. So, yeah, that's interesting. And I figured maybe if anything, like somebody had told them, like gyne- gynecology wise, like you know, this is surgical if they were bothered by it. But yeah, I think that with Instagram and social media, clearly women are more aware of what they look like versus what others and again if pornography has become more pronounced even, or pronounced in a younger generation then it's going to only increase right yeah but i think sure. women are sitting around and talking a lot more about this kind of stuff too like my mom wasn't talking to her girlfriends about what her vagina looked like or if she's ever done any treatment or thought about it you know that i think it's changing as we are all sitting around we're talking about it there's more just oh. openness about mm-hmm. it, it's well, not as taboo it's to talk a about sexual these different things. Girl. Like it's yeah. so done, but it's gonna, it's one without borders this time. Right? Yeah, <laughs> you know? it has no borders. Yeah. It's open. So I think that's the big issue. Is and again, I think that they're noticing others, and then under eighteen, I think it was like a five percent of labioplasties done, mm-hmm. which is crazy. 18. Is that yeah, it's being it's. Reasonable? I, I th- I, I'm you seeing think? you know older teenagers um i I can't say that i've seen somebody under 18 yet but certainly early college age 19 20 21 i'm learning a ton about uh genital (laughs) cosmetic (laughs) surgery today (laughs) yeah this is this is awesome but vaginal aesthetics like we call it vaginal rejuvenation vagina from tennessee just so you know i love it so the the you know External labioplasty is something that you know, we do a lot of and are doing more of all mm-hmm. the time. What do what do women who are looking for internal reju- vaginal rejuvenation? What are the symptoms that bring them in, and then how do the how does the laser help with that? So it's interesting because like the hormones and the sexual vaginal rejuvenation they kind cross of cross over, a lot. over mm-hmm. a lot because so if somebody comes in with hormone complaints, like the whole list of questions also goes through yeah. a lot of sexual questions, you know, vaginal dryness, pain, orgasms, whether it's clitoral, whether it's vaginal. So, you know, even what their drive is, you know, all of that because they cross over. So if they're coming with hormone complaints, we're almost talking to them about sexual wellness too. And if they come with sexual wellness, again, we've already we're talked talk to them about, about that cell optimization. So if they want, you know, vaginal rejuvenation, you know, we talk to them about like how to optimize again, results and lasting results. So they tend to complain of urinary incontinence. So a lot of them have had children you know, yeah. so just the weight of the pregnancy obliterates like the support of the Cold urethra. Floor. So that's our younger women. Incontinence, urinary incontinence and vaginal laxity. Yep, laxity from pregnancy. Decreased orgasmic strength is a huge one in perimenopause and menopause. And so it's going to go down with time. Men and women both have changes with time, different changes. Absolutely. And so vaginal dryness, pain, pain with, with sex, intercourse, all yeah. of that. So, um, so really laxity, urinary incontinence, pain, vaginal dryness, and orgasmic changes. Those are the big things that they're complaining about. And it depends on the age, depends on the patient. Absolutely. You know, if they're young, mm-hmm. they've had one pregnancy, they don't tolerate urinary incontinence anymore. Like it's mm-hmm. unacceptable to, you know, accept something as part of the process, mm-hmm. like childbearing. It's yeah. crazy aging. how many women come in and they say, well, my doctor just told me to wear a pad for my stress incontinence. I'm like, what? Why, yeah. why is that a solution? Mm-hmm. Just wear a pad or an adult diaper. So we'll get a lot of... At, 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 at 35 you, years old? I mean, right? <laughs> You'd yeah. be surprised. Yeah. You're kidding. How many women are like, my my doctor told me to wear a liner, a pad. I'm like, what? Like that blows my mind that women wow. are being told that. And we looked at a study not that long ago, and that was the number one. Like 80%. Yeah, like 80% of physicians are recommending adult diapers or pads. As for urinary incontinence, for stress urinary incontinence, eighty percent, and that, that was, was the like top recommendation. Twenty nineteen, like it wasn't that long ago. That Mm-mm. 
it was that survey, it blew our mind. We're like, that is the most ridiculous thing when there are so many options out there. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, it's, it, you brought up urine incontinence. One of the things that we do that kind of has the side effect of helping stress incontinence is a tummy tuck mm -hmm. because you're, you're part of that stress that incontinence complex. is, yeah, is, is a loss of, you know, abdominal pressure from, you know, increase in domain so that fascia, mm -hmm. the muscle layers stretch out. And so by that. fixing, you know, your, your Holding rectus or your together. six pack muscles, you increase that pressure and can help for mild urine incontinence can treat it. Wow, I didn't so, even think about I that. I didn't either. We talk yeah. a lot about platelet-rich plasma. Mm -hmm. The O-shot, we yeah. talk a lot about radio frequency. Um, so we do Votiva. Mm -hmm. Or we talk about microneedling internal um, and external. So that's one thing we've never really, that's ever yeah. crossed yeah. my mind for women. Yeah. We even talk about uh, Kegels, right? So yeah. there's lasers out there to help. Do a HIIT workout for your vagina with yeah. electromuscular <laughs> yeah. stimulation. I mean, there's all kinds of things out there. We have probably a full suite of things for women's health, but that's one thing I've never really yeah. thought of for them to address. Yeah, I didn't know that. I was almost thinking it would lift overall, but you're you're talking about you're containing, it's, and yeah. so it's going to improve all of that. Yeah, it's yeah. a it's a pressure it's a pressure. Yeah, solution. and I almost want to get on into that um, abdominal, you know, abdominal. Um, abdominal plastic or, or surgical options, but also even body contouring, but I don't want to take away from the sexual just yet because it's interesting because people come to us with like a weight loss issue or, a, you know, an issue that needs more than just body contouring and body contouring is awesome, mm -hmm. but there's a, an extent, you know, there, oh, yeah. it's beyond sure. a level sometimes and they need surgical and we could talk about that too, because I'm always very realistic. We are here you know, you can spend a lot of money doing body contouring, but if it's a circumferential, you know, thing and it's like a, you know, skin excess, you know, it's not That's, something. We're yeah. not yeah. fixing yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. And, and skin, it, skin excess and skin laxity. You know, mm -hmm. if you're, if you're seeing that patient, that mm -hmm. hormone deficient patient with poor collagen and just floppy skin, even if it doesn't look like they've got a lot of excess, see a ton of unhappy patients from cool sculpting or whatever oh, yeah. the, oh, we the, see a lot. you know, non-surgical body contouring mm -hmm. where they're not like you are, where you're looking at the skin and the, and kind of making that assessment, but just saying, Oh yeah, toss them on the machine and we'll get rid of some of that fat. And then they end up either with no change or looking worse. Yeah, so, correct. Absolutely. And I think addressing that comprehensively, just like the sexual wellness or hormones and um, is important. So like, again, we'll do a lot of things like hormone optimization is going to already increase muscle mass, metabolism, help them lose weight, they're more energetic for a workout. We have peptides we can do, you know, so that then you're controlling all the other aspects of it. So we do that way before we ever, you know, got into body contouring if yeah. there mm -hmm. was weight loss that needed to happen first. But again, skin excess and laxity, is not something, you know, that can yeah. always yeah. be corrected. And so. those patients were saying, this is surgical. Yeah. 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 Well, and just making, again, it's about them getting the results they want. And if you can't provide it, we need to tell them. Right. Exactly. You know, yeah. There's, because otherwise they're unhappy and you don't want unhappy patients. They want results. So if they decide to proceed with something, despite you telling them, that's mm -hmm. one thing, but you got to be yeah. transparent. Yeah. And I think in our industry, Honesty is, it yeah, is with yeah. anything. Honesty mm -hmm. is, is kind yeah. of first priority with yeah. everybody. Faraday, you, 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 again, you tried to sneak another one by me. <laughs> <laughs> the, okay, the O shot. What, I, you hear, what is that? So I we can't imagine your, oh. catching you that you try yeah. to sneak those <laughs> yeah. things. Mm -hmm. I just throw those things yeah, out like, there. We got all kinds of stuff. It just like rolls off your tongue. I'm like, wait a second, what is that? Yeah, so we take platelet-rich plasma. So we take mm -hmm. your blood, spin it down, take the platelet-rich plasma from there, and then we re-inject that into the clitoral hood and in through the G-spot. So we are helping build collagen elastin, supporting that urethra, and it helps a lot with stress incontinence for women. So we get that orgasmic improvement in strength, and then we also get to help support that collagen elastin build in between the anterior vaginal wall and that urethra. So it helps help some of that incontinence and laxity there. And like nerves and blood flow. And so nerves and blood flow, of course. With everything. So PRP started in orthopedics, mm -hmm. you know, with all of the growth factors in PRP and platelets. So, you know, when we take that injected vaginally, we're doing it right through the G spot mm -hmm. and into the clitoris. 
So you're going to get nerve regeneration and blood vessel regeneration. So you have increased blood flow, which is lubrication, increased sensitivity, and again, collagen last and support of the urethra. So orgasmic, the O shot, you know, so yeah. just, I mean, women love the O shot and I love, we love it's to a pair double it with, yeah, orgasmic no. strength and stress and, and stress incontinence. <laughs> yeah. And it's not going to do an overall tightening of the vaginal wall. So like when you're talking about laxity, we're not going to get, we're not going to be addressing that with an O shot. We love to pair O shot with our vaginal rejuvenation because you're going to basically do something to the vaginal canal. Usually it's heating in some way. So we have three different devices. So it's either RF heating, RF heating, but we're penetrating. So like a micro needling in the vaginal canal. And then, or we're doing um, the erbium, you know, which mm -hmm. we're penetrating with heat, telling it it's injured. So you get collagen elastin stimulation, mm -hmm. tightening, and then blood flow and nerve sensitivity. And then we dump a bunch of growth factors in with the first treatment so that we have the O-shot going with the first treatment with amazing results. So, so how do yeah. you do anesthesia for that? Because I would imagine that just sounds like it would hurt. No. Topical and a little bit of lidocaine. Really? Mm -hmm. A clitoral block. A clitoral block. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just so like with do. the P yeah. shot for guys, we do a chemo. Block. Yeah, we do do we do do P shot too. Yeah, I got it. Got it. Got it. Okay, just go ahead and lay it on me. He's like, <laughs> guys say like that. zero, maybe one yeah. from that initial injection from the lidocaine for the penile block. Maybe a one, but most men say on a pain scale zero to ten, they're a zero. Okay, and and what does that do? So, what does the P shot do? Same thing for women: increase blood flow, right? Elasticity, build that collagen elastin, help with erectile strength. Um, blood flow, all of that. We're doing it and we're usually pairing it again, like we pair women with Botiva or Morpheus V, we're pairing it with like a Gaines Wave treatment. So we're trying to improve that blood flow and then trying to get that vessels, right, to repair and hold all that blood flow in. What is Gaines Wave? I don't, I'm not familiar with that. Oh, we're just opening yeah, your like, world yeah, into like, all I'm the sexual wellness. So this is what we so do we, here. Yeah. So we, again, talk about sex all yeah. day long. All day like, long. You know, sex so and hormones. Yeah. With hormones, we're talking about sexual stuff. And so, because again, people don't have a lot of places to go, right? Men or right. women. So, and we all age. We kind of talked about that earlier. We're all going to experience aging. Mm -hmm. With time, so with women, it's laxity, decreased orgasmic strength, urinary incontinence, especially with hormonal changes or pregnancies. <laughs> Where men, it's inevitable too that eventually they're going to have decreased blood flow, decreased erection quality, decreased reliability. So they might lose like morning erections or nocturnal erections, or they can't consistently keep an erection. Right, women can so, hide it, but men can't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So everyone, everybody in the room knows what's going on with you. So, <laughs> so they have different things. But Gaines wave is an acoustic shock wave that basically is telling the tissue it's injured versus the laser for women. And so it's telling the tissue it's injured. So you get blood vessel repair. And again, the penile vessels are the smallest in the body. So they're one to two millimeters, coronary arteries, three to four, carotids even bigger. So it's the it's a barometer of vascular health. So they're going to notice erection changes before they notice anything else. So you can do so the earlier the better so mm -hmm. if it's like you know i'm maybe drinking maybe losing an erection can't keep it but then maybe i'm not drinking it's happening a couple times that's the time erections are changing treatments. in the morning noticing mm -hmm. minor changes mm -hmm. so you basically are doing it over the penis over the scrotum to tell the tissue it's injured so blood vessels and nerves and then the smooth muscle the corpus cavernosum you know you're going to improve the health of that collagen elastin so when we get the blood flow in we want it to stay so the P-shot kind of focuses in on the penis and all the regeneration there. So likewise, we do Gaines Wave, pair it with the P-shot. Dump all so those growth factors in. No, no man left behind. We can't do yeah. women and not men. We right? do women and men. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Mind is blown. Yeah, I was, yeah. Re I was reading your, your website, and which is beautiful, by the way. The, Thank but you. I was looking, I was like, I don't know what half of this stuff is. <laughs> like, I've got a lot to learn. Well, we don't like learn, like, again, we don't learn hormones in traditional medicine. We're both mm -hmm. traditionally trained and you don't learn it. And I think endocrinologists don't even know it because they frequently don't have people that don't have women as they age on estrogen or on the right thyroid replacement. So you have to almost branch out and learn it. But like what we're doing is on the realm of regenerative medicine. So lasers are regeneration. You know, so now we're starting to talk about how to regenerate. And I think that's the next step. Like that's almost like 
a revolution in and of itself. Not the sexual one. This one might have boundaries, <laughs> us, you know, but this but one is awesome time. because you're using, you, you're basically regenerating tissue instead of sometimes um, cutting or using medicines for it, mm-hmm. if it can. So if it's mild, so if they're coming for, um, I mean, it's almost as if like med spa versus surgical, like your filler is augmenting what you're doing surgically and they're working together. Mm -hmm. And so that's frequently what we need for tissue function too. And sexual function is we need everything to work together. And so, yeah. And I, and and that's, you know, bring up the surgical part of it, that that's plastic surgery is moving, you know, has been moving in a regenerative direction for a long time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're seeing more and more, um, regenerative treatments mm-hmm. kind of take over. You know, it's unusual for me to do a facelift now without pairing it with fat injections. Yeah. Um, okay. And, you know, fat grafting to the breast, to the buttocks, you know, f- all over the body has kind of become really standard in a lot of practices. Or even more contouring, probably with mm-hmm. filler, mm-hmm. you know, all of that. Or regenerating yeah. with lasers, so it's a more comprehensive exactly. treatment mm-hmm. than it ever was before. So they went mm-hmm. to surgery, surgeons for surgery, and now that's a comprehensive treatment. Right. And it's almost as if that's all that's offered. You know, they're probably going to not be as completely happy with the results because you're going to pair, you know, some contouring. So that looks great, but let's add some contouring or laser regeneration and all that. So it's kind of the same with us. It's the and again, back and to cell health too. We got to add those hormones back in. We mm-hmm. got to treat that base function of that cell. We've got to make it as healthy as possible and make the body as healthy as possible so that when we're doing these treatments, we're not seeing regression sooner than we should. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then actually when you're talking about building bones, so like, again, when it comes to the earlier women are on hormones, so as soon as they can be, the better. Mm -hmm. So perimenopause, 40 to 55, seeing it younger now because we don't produce hormones like we used to, toxicities that we're exposed to. But the earlier you replace um, progesterone and testosterone in the perimenopause, the better because the only thing that maintains or even builds bone. So if they have like low DEXA scans and their osteoporosis or osteopenia, you can actually build bone with hormones and hormone optimization and vitamin D. So -hmm. that's the other thing we don't ever think about. It's a pro hormone, but it actually builds bone too and supports bone health. So, you know, then they get less bone resorption with time. You know, it's still, you're still going to have aging. You can't correct everything, but at least you can support and slow Mm -hmm. it down a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, another question, it kind of not to shift gears, but a lot, but shift gears a little bit, um, is I, you've got a really comprehensive lab in the back of your clinic for IV therapy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's been something that has been talked about a lot recently. How can IV therapy help in the kind of the post-surgical period, and I'm kind of being selfish, thinking about my, my patients mm-hmm. recovering from, you know, three, four, six-hour operation. What do we use? When do we start? You know, how can we, how, what do we need to partner mm-hmm. to help optimize yeah. post-surgical recovery? So you get all that recovery. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So high-dose vitamin C has been shown in lots of studies to, um, to promote healing after mm-hmm mainly because it's an antioxidant. So it's, you know, decreases inflammation, oxidative stress, all of that is happening post-surgery, right? If they can do it before and almost immediately after, there's no complications, it doesn't increase bleeding rate, nothing. So it's not gonna make anything worse with surgery or in the recovery period, but can significantly improve uh, recovery times because it's Mm anti-inflammatory. And so you get that inflammation and that's mainly what causes swelling and pain, right? at least I'm thinking they can't decrease or they can't move like they used to because it's a lot of pain and swelling. Mm-hmm. And so that's right. I just vitamin C, you know, all the way. And in fact, used for cancer therapies mm-hmm. um, or at least preventing side effects with chemotherapy. Mm-hmm. You know, so there's lots of benefits to just IV therapy mm-hmm. and promoting healing and making your patients get better faster. Absolutely. Maybe come waddling into the post <laughs> appointment yes. you know and lots of pain with it so yeah. yeah um we do like here we 
put together all the drips, you can actually even talk a little bit yeah. more about so that. So we mm-hmm. do a ton of different IVs. We do, um, like Dr. Dr. said, the high dose vitamin C. We do kind of like a souped up um, Myers cocktail. So all of your B vitamins, some minerals. We do glutathione added on to a lot of our IV drips. Um, there's alpha lipoic acid. So a lot of things to help with antioxidants healing just overall to feel better, getting that energy back. Um, We do NAD drips. So that is also DNA repair. Um, Just quite a bit. We customize a lot of stuff. So even for our athletes, so post-workout for recovery, we do amino acids. We add um, glutamine, arginine, lysine, valine, and I'm missing one, but there's another one in that carnitine. mixture, carnitine, mm-hmm. to help with recovery after working out. So we have a pretty extensive IV lounge here that we are sitting in today that our patients can come and be, any, be here anywhere from an hour to six, depending on the drip. Wow. That's a pretty comfortable place. If like they're pissed off and a little uncomfortable, we have some rooms too. But so the history of IV therapy, because it's interesting, because it's been used for a while too, but because nothing is drug company sponsored or supported Mm -hmm. you don't yeah no it's all about the money and if you follow the money it's so easy but now they're actually i think in 2021 or maybe the early part of this year they just came out with high dose vitamin c as part of um cancer therapy like not just preventing side effects but cancer therapy so some studies recently and just using high dose vitamin C for cancer therapy is not just in like an adjunct to cancer therapy or preventing side effects. So it's been around for a long time, but because drug companies don't support, can't do studies, it isn't as promoted as it's going to start being, I think. So what typically would happen is regenerative medicine doctors, the ones that are doing like all the the functional medicine Mm -hmm. doctors. And again, that's not us. That's doctors that are doing like really sick patients with, you know, Lyme disease or something mm-hmm. big and they're working through it. And it's a lot of work to and get a ton with that. the gut health to, and the microbiome yeah. and all yeah. of that. Very they need extensive. to have all of, uh, I mean, they're very good at what they do, which is why, cause it's so detailed. And yeah. so mm-hmm. they have to specialize in it, but they would do drips to treat those patients over like maybe four hour periods. So I did my training and learned these long, very complex drips and multiple trainings. And then I realized Nobody's staying here for four hours to get an IV therapy drip. So I basically took and reformulated those to go over an hour. And it's based on osmolarity and blood. And so like if you're giving lactated ringers or normal saline, it's like approximately 300 milliosmoles per liter. So your drip has to be close to that too. So that's the nice thing about it now. It took a long time. It took me about a year to formulate prior to even this being open. And then she does have a pharmacy degree. She doesn't yeah. talk a lot about that. She <laughs> so was first like, a pharmacist yeah, so, before I mean, a physician. Well, so I got very, <laughs> so like she so, talks about yeah, it like, no big yeah, deal. Yeah. I just created these. She make a 300 milliosmolar solution. Yeah. yeah. So what, I mean, so. it took a lot of learning, but it's yeah. very, like, I loved it. And as I learned what you could do with IV therapy, like, again, there was no way I wasn't putting an IV therapy lounge in this place because it just, it, it's an adjunct to everything we do. And so we do formulate, customized so we can change because we know the science behind it. So high dose vitamin C is technically 25 grams, but we can do 50 grams. We can do 75 grams if we wanted to. So we can customize, which is nice. And those might take a little bit longer Mm -hmm. just Mm -hmm. because of side effects. And then our NAD bags do sometimes go four to six hours, but the majority of them. are great, like again, it's used for like um, addiction, alcohol, Mm -hmm. drug, you can titrate up and titrate down, but it's great anti-aging mitochondrial support too. And then I think the big thing for us for beauty is if you put glutathione in anything. So for you, like mm-hmm. recovery post-op, yeah. you know, they as soon as they can get in, and they should always do one before because it improves it already. Cause every like vitamin C and high dose concentrates in the white blood cell. So your immune support and anti-inflammation is highest in that um, perioperative. And mm-hmm. then if they can get one after, it's even better. But a lot of times they're in pain and it's hard to do. Yeah. But then glutathione, because it's the master antioxidant. So all of Hollywood's doing the glutathione drips, like just for yeah. skin brightening and you know making everything brighter and lighter. And and so that's a big selling one too. People come looking for it. You know, Great for because, aesthetics, but mm-hmm. also just because it's an antioxidant. Yeah. yeah. It's wonderful for the body. Mm-hmm. How long before surgery for, for some of these, you know, glutathione, vitamin C infusions, how long before 
or how close to their surgery would you recommend somebody so come here? So I would do here? within 24 hours really? of their surgery, like right before. It's not going to interfere with your surgery. Okay. Um, and of course, sure. everybody out there, talk to yeah. your surgeon before yeah. you yeah, go and get an IV. I feel like we have to say yeah, those I mean, things, of course. Well, but. absolutely. I mean, you don't want to let your your surgeon not know what you're doing. Exactly. Right. Very they, important. They, You might find out they won't do surgery when you should. Right. Back. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I got to throw that little yeah. caveat yeah. out there. Yeah, yeah. I would yeah. Always yes, double check yeah. with your surgeon before you do that. Always, but we do yeah. see patients here pre-op and yeah. post-op. Yeah. Neat. And the other interesting thing is like peptides. Like, so again, there's like two peptides in particular that come to mind with this. And so it's all part of that regenerative. And once mm -hmm. you hear about it, you'll be learning. I know you. Oh, yeah. You'll be, oh, like, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You'll be yeah. like reading all, all about the peptide, all, everything. Like, and again, you know, as that regenerative medicine thing just expands and blows up, like you can't help but get excited to learn more about it. Um, and I think Tony Robbins' Life Force book is like kind of bringing that to like the public. Sums it so all we up don't keep up. If we don't keep up, they come in asking us about, you know, certain things that we don't know anything about. So you almost have to stay up. Mm -hmm. But and I know you. It won't. Yeah, it'll be on the way home. Oh yeah. Uh, oh yeah. yeah. His, well, you you mentioned Tony Robbins' book. It's it's like on my Kindle. Is like yeah, next up. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, I just He's started. Listening, read it. I've yeah. had so many patients come in. And they're like, have you read it? You know, so as soon as I hear that and, and I started listening and it's e exactly what we would love to learn about. But peptides are like, again, one of those regenerative medicine type of things you can do. Mm -hmm. So BPC, CJC, have you heard anything no, about this? No, I, I, only, only the letters. Us peppering but, yeah, it in yeah, here and yeah, there in conversation. Yeah, but, yeah talk, talk, <laughs> talk to me a little bit about the peptide. So growth hormone, for yeah. instance, like the growth hormone thing is like in the 90s started to be more restricted. Mm -hmm. So before that, it was being used for injury. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of athletes with injuries, they would go on growth hormone and obviously it has great benefits. If it could be a drug, it would be perfect. It'd be a perfect drug because it has, you know, decreased inflammation, healing. I mean, it does everything that testosterone does, but better. So libido, brain fog, energy, you know, healing, decreased inflammation, um, decreased endurance. lipid uh, profiles. Yeah, yeah, decreased injury, you know. So now it's restricted and you can't use it much, but now there's a peptide that can increase growth hormone. So CJC1295 and Evermorlin. Is will help the body use. increase its own naturally. So we're not giving it external. So we're not shutting down the body's production, which is so important. Mm -hmm. We're just supporting its own natural production. So it is not something you have to worry about being on long term. A lot of these drugs that shut down the body's natural functioning, you've got to take that into consideration when you're starting a patient on that because you don't want to do long term damage. Right. So this is one that it will promote the body's own natural increase in growth hormone and mimic its natural rhythm at night and in the morning. So it's yeah. pretty cool. Interesting. So it's like it's like erythropoietin or EPO for you know, mm -hmm. the audience who's who's kind of heard about that and to increase blood production. Absolutely. It's the same thing for growth hormone. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So Very now cool. you can optimize not only hormones, and I always recommend hormone optimization first, and then we'll add growth hormone optimization. So CJC 1295 is growth hormone. It looks like growth hormone. It's a shorter segment of growth hormone releasing hormone. So it goes to the pituitary, has the pituitary increase growth hormone production. We still have small spikes as we age, but it peaks at 20. Mm -hmm. And so then it starts to go down. So, but they're still there. They just need to be stimulated, but not overstimulated. And growth hormone, mm -hmm. if you're giving it, it's doing the peripheral effects and then it's shutting down your own system. Where this increases your growth hormone, goes to the liver, and produces IGF-1, which does all the effects, you know, mm -hmm. all the positive effects of it. So it doesn't shut it down, and it also doesn't overstimulate if it dosed appropriately. And, of course, you have down regulation of receptors if you take it on a continuous basis. So they used to um, cycle it every three months and come off of it for a month, but now you can do it. It's an injectable at home. Um, most of the peptides are if they're mm -hmm. really eff effective. Five days on, two days off, five days on, you know. And so it just stimulates enough, doesn't overstimulate, doesn't shut down. But now you have growth hormone optimization and all the positive benefits without the downside. Without the negative yeah. side effects. It, now, is this another, you know, we talked earlier about being able to measure hormone levels. Is this something else that you measure and kind of track when they're on the, the peptide treatments? So you don't with this. So. Okay. So it's a small segment. So even measuring growth hormone 
is expensive. Yeah. And so this is growth hormone releasing hormone, but it's a small segment of it. So it's like 29 amino acids. So like you're not going to ever be able to measure that. But even then it was expensive. But you mm -hmm. can measure IGF-1 levels baseline yes. yeah. and you can measure them post. The only pre issue, and post. We do it okay. pre, mm -hmm. finding that initial always as a screen. The, the, the big issue is like pre, you want a baseline that tells you it's at least at a level you're going to produce yeah. so that your pituitary is working enough and those somatotropes are working enough that they're going to work for production, but you're not going to get sustained. So by the time they're in here getting blood levels, honestly, you're not going to see a sustained because the half-life is 30 minutes, just like growth hormone releasing hormone. Mm -hmm. goes to the liver, it's produces IGF-1, does, does the effects, and then it's gone. And Tassimorlin was a third generation. So if anyone ever asked, like, Samorlin was first generation. Those so are the Arnold had, days. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, the Samorlin? Yeah. 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 Well, and I think some places still use it, but it does have effect on prolactin and cortisol. And so it That's affects other hormones. So you have side effects with it. And then you have um, CJC, which is second generation, which I think is ideal for use. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tassimorlin was a third generation, temporarily not available, but because... Of, I think it wasn't a regulatory, I think something to do with COVID, honestly. Most of the peptides, if they went away for a short period of time, was because somebody was using them, you know, in the COVID scenario. Somehow and, or another, yeah. and it got pulled. But it does get you sustained results with that, which is really not what you want. So it was used in a more short term for somebody with maybe like abdominal, like metabolic syndrome. Mm -hmm. So if a man comes in or a woman, again, like with metabolic syndrome, you know, then that was a better peptide to use. But okay. short term, though. Yeah. Not long short term. term. Where CJC, if a more loan, we can stay on long term. Okay. And you actually see better results long term. When you say long term, what's a treatment course? At least six months before okay. we tell everyone, give it at mm -hmm. least three to six months to start seeing sustained uh, benefits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So six months is ideal. Like, because yeah. you're going to get your biggest strides, like Faraday said, in three to six months. But you can stay on it indefinitely if you want you know, because it optimizes growth hormones, so it prepares your body not to get injured, and your, like, endurance is better, your muscle building is better. So, honestly, for women, and you can cycle them off and back on, but without tumor history, you know, mm -hmm. then there's not that contraindication. But for muscle, for women as we age, you know, again, one of the biggest complaints is weight gain and body composition change. So that's why, you know, all of a sudden we're seeing sagging, we want, you know, arm surgery you know even the thighs which i'm not sure there's a big Top i don't of the know knees. how mm -hmm. much you can do for like above the knees in abdominal and so this actually does a great job of body composition changes but again it's a slow process over time because you're optimizing growth hormone again yeah. that's really interesting i didn't i was totally unaware that you would see, start seeing you know surface changes yeah. with oh, something with a, you know peptide infused that well, is really and then cool and is paired with mm -hmm. cjc typically and epimorlin just inhibits the negative feedback on the pituitary. So basically, they're both increasing growth hormone, but they're used together usually. So very cool neat. Stuff. Yeah. Well, I was uh, as you were talking, you kind of mentioned the testosterone, and I had a question about testosterone and some of these like Propecia, um, because I know a lot of guys who are in my demographic are concerned with hair loss and or thinning, mm -hmm. and you know, how does testosterone and Propecia work together? Can you can you get testosterone supplementation if you need it and still be taking Propecia for your hair? Do, do you need to? So we can go on forever and ever. Yeah. Forever and ever and ever. So testosterone converts into dihydrotestosterone, which is 10 times more anabolic. And so when we're seeing our patients for testosterone, male and female, because females can see that same yeah. because it's the same pathway, we're always looking at those DHT levels. So there are medications that can slow that conversion so that we're not seeing that excess hair loss. Um, there are some natural supplements like salt palmetto, right? So we put minerals. patients on minerals. We put patients on some supplements sometimes to help with that. But spironolactone is great mm -hmm. um, to slow that conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. We can also um, hit those uh, follicles at the site and do topicals to help minimize that DHT response at the hair follicle site. So there is a lot of options there for men and women that we watch on the front end. So we grab those DHT levels on the very front side of it. Some of the patients we see that have come from clinics that are just 
running shots weekly, right? Yeah. They're not looking mm-hmm. at any of that. So we're correcting that when we come in. So I think it's almost like, again, um, dosed appropriately, treated appropriately, followed appropriately. Exactly. You can mm-hmm. prevent any side effects that you're going to get and, you know, and dose appropriately so that you don't get um, also not just side effects, but adverse long-term effects. So I think getting more data points at the beginning, like a DHT level, what's your free testosterone, your binding globulin, like all of those are important. Dosing is appropriately um, done so that like, again, pellets, you know, is something that you make a small incision and you insert pellets under the skin that slowly release. And so that slow release, keep your levels up and keep them up versus injectable so that once a week at the low T clinic, In and then down, hormones. in and down, and yeah. creams don't work. I mean, nobody feels better in creams, but they're like a variation. And so, the more that you go up and down, we want test say testosterone. But if you're going up and down, you're getting those variations. When you're peaking, you're converting. Mm-hmm. So estrogen for men, man boobs. Like we're very because again, I want men to know that there's options, and so the yes. once a week is not a good option. I mean, we do injectables, we dose it differently. Because once you get an adverse effect, it's harder to treat, like hair loss or growth or playing catch tissue. Up. Yeah. And so... Or we're sending them to yeah. surgeons. Yeah. yeah. But again, it can. So DHT, even if not high, can concentrate in the hair follicle, like Faraday mm-hmm. said. And so putting a topical on like Propecia, but you never want to take... The most important takeaway from all of this is you never want to be on Propecia without testosterone optimization because there are lots of studies that show erectile dysfunction that they report to be irreversible so if you're not optimized so self-treatment over you know mm-hmm. the internet treatments like hey i want testosterone the, the, right the him, the I'm the him's yes, treatment. Yes, yeah. yeah not mm-hmm. a good option no. you know because okay. that's when you run into trouble you want to mm-hmm. go to somebody you trust they're trust or they're testing everything but also even if it's concentrating at the hair follicle, if you want to use Mastrite, that's the way to use it because you're just using it topically and it prevents that conversion at the hair follicle. So that's good to know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's complex and like we like, again, it's what we love, but like you have to know and manage it well to prevent because, and even then sometimes we'll run into issues. So it's problem troubleshooting, problem solving, Absolutely. you know, and a lot of that can be based on a conversation, mm-hmm. but yeah. And then good relationships with compounding pharmacies because those pharmacists have all kinds of fun little concoctions they they can Mm -hmm. make for us. Yeah, yeah. 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 And there's a couple really good ones locally that are wealth of knowledge. If ever like you're you have questions about you know dosing or a different route or yeah, Yeah. I'll just I'll just I'll just send it to you. It's all good. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. you send us the hormones. We'll send you the I'll just send this to you. That's, yeah. That is above my pay grade, yeah. as you can tell by the questions I've been asking. No, no, I think it's a great conversation to have because, like, everything that you're doing, you know, is a comprehensive approach to yeah. it and, and knowing you yeah. know, treat the inside and the them. outside. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think that's a, that's kind of the takeaway. That's what I've gotten from this is that, you know, aesthetics kind of, they say beauty is skin deep. It, it actually isn't. It, it, mm, it, it goes, goes deeper. It goes Much way deeper. deeper. Yeah. And, you know, probably the best treatment is a marriage of the, you know, the surface treatments, what we can do with our lasers, you know, mm-hmm. injectables, things like that, surgery, and then hormone treatments, peptide treatments, IV infusions. I mean, it's Absolutely. just overall, overall wellness. Yeah, it, mm-hmm. it, it is. We want it's every patient wellness. to be the healthiest version of themselves they can be when they walk out these doors. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. There is one that we haven't talked about. What? You know, I'm like, little, I know, you know, I'm crazy. it's our favorite. So What's BPC that? is a peptide that we haven't. And this is actually a great perioperative. There's yeah. just one more. The yeah. two peptides that really work are CJC for growth hormone. Yeah. And again, for even us, like using peptides to optimize and, you know, we oh. want to be our best selves for our patients too. Absolutely. And again, if we're living examples, they want to live it too. So like they want to see their providers, you know doing the same things, right? Yeah. Or having but, personal experience, they can yeah. talk about it. Yeah. So but BPC-157, BPC stands for Body Protective Compound. It actually decreases inflammation, wound healing. It helps with tendon healing and ligament healing. It is amazing. We see this for oh, patients cool. with acute and chronic injuries. Um, and we see a lot post-operative. We mm-hmm. have some local physicians that will send their surgery patients to us for BPC to help um, 
expedite the healing process, the recovery process post-surgery. Mm-hmm. Is this now? Is this something that you can do before surgery to help? Absolutely. And the yeah, quicker you can do it before, like definitely thirty days before, but if you can be on it even longer, once you like, once you learn a little more about BPC, you'll love it as much as I do. Like it's again just Could out of all the peptides, it's probably the one that. You know, nothing in life is like immediate gratification, but this yeah. is a peptide that within two to four weeks, patients have relief of pain. Wow. Mm-hmm. It is amazing. It and changed my husband's life. So personal experience, my husband was walking around with pain of seven, eight every single day on a 10 scale with chronic back pain. He was very active, athlete, very hard on his body with BPC. He's down to a zero one. Wow. Just mm-hmm. because of inflammation and the compression on nerves and just overall just that pain and on the joint. they come in with an acute injury. So, like, again, so a lot of patients remote with BPC because mm-hmm. it's hard to get peptide physicians and, you know, appropriately prescribing physicians nationwide. So um, they will reach out remotely, even if they have, like, so if it's local remote, they have an acute injury that they want. And, again, they're on the Internet, right, searching. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. they're like BPC, like what helps with, yeah. there's so much. Have you heard of Ben Greenfield? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. he does like a blog on it and basically oh, yeah. says this shit should be illegal. It probably will be soon because I had improvement of this and this. And, you know, so everyone's talking about it. There's tons of stuff on the Internet. So when they reach out, if they have acute injury that we're treating, if they have some chronic pain, it's gone too. Um, but for surgery... The quicker you can use it before, and definitely 30 days is a good time frame. You're prepping the body. You can do it perioperatively. Again, no drug interactions. It's not a drug that's not going to affect surgery. And then post-op, there like, it allows inflammation, but not too much. So most of the the healing, you know, that takes so long is because they're inflamed. They're it's painful. They can't move. And the orthopedic results are phenomenal. And so as orthopedic surgeons start to use it more and more, you know, sometimes they don't need to do surgery, but if they do, they're getting faster recovery times. So. Can you combine the BPC injection with a vitamin C infusion? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You can combine it with CJC. You can combine it with wow. testosterone. You yeah. can use it really in conjunction with any of the therapies that we do here. Mm-hmm. That's very cool. I'm, gonna, I'm definitely going to have to look, look more oh, yeah. into that. That's, that's no, it's definitely very... cool. It's like it's one of my probably favorite. my favorite. Mm-hmm. Just like and across so the board with our patient. The end to I know. It. I mean, <laughs> she she almost, yeah, yeah. Like, hey, she snuck a lot in. She, she and she did. Like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, usually, just yeah, like oh, yeah. BPC, CJC. Yeah, yeah. She couldn't let yeah. this testosterone, be shot. Yeah. You're good. Yeah, yeah. 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 There's your order. Yeah. What was the order again? I'll have to listen to the Yeah, exactly. So, anything else you think we need to like for? hormone or Dr. Hall, for maybe? healing definitely we kind of hit the two main ones for with surgery where peptides is that cjc of a and bpc but you would it is amazing the bpc results the feedback we get from patients just it's been so life-changing for so many of our patients i think that's why it's probably my favorite because you get quick results and yeah. nothing in life is quick and i feel like a lot of times we just put band-aids on things steroid injections right Let's just yeah. stick some cortisol in, uh, um, cortisol in it, and then um, we're just breaking down bone yeah. versus a functional change. That is really yeah, because that that's that is you know a lot and a lot of a lot of Western medicine is putting band aids on things, yeah. and so that this is this yeah. is exciting. Yeah. Pretty cool. When, exciting and just knowing about. that there's so small a percentage of patients that your your surgical patients that are even hormonally optimized, and knowing you know the increased. Um, or decreased healing time, you know, anti-inflammatory effects, you know, the healing times, the immune support, you know, just hormones alone, just knowing, you know, as your patients, you know, listen to this and, you know, we're prepping and as you're talking to them, I'm sure they, you know, they have a period of time, everything's a a wait time now, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you can't, so they have that time where they can at least start thinking about it beforehand and help you, you know, get results that are, quicker for sure you know, more sustained better all that yeah, yeah. that I, well that's that that is certainly true i'm uh, I, like i said i've learned a lot today mm-hmm. this has been a lot of fun um is there anything from that any questions that you have that your patients would want to know about surgery as it relates to hormones or just in general i think the biggest ones are kind of 
do we need to come off, right? That's yeah. always a finding a surgeon yeah. that is not going to freak out that they're on hormones, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Mm -hmm. With pellets, we can't really remove the yeah, pellets, right? So if it's something where if we're doing an estrogen pellet, if we need to wait, mm -hmm. what does that look like for the patient? Mm -hmm. Can we go to a transdermal if we have to? Um, and then downtime. I think mm -hmm. that's always like the biggest thing with patients too is, well, if I'm doing X, Y, Z with you all, and then I'm doing surgery here, what's my mm -hmm. downtime look like? How much time would I have to be off hormones? How much time do I have to wait till I get to the gym? Because mm -hmm. that's big. A lot of our patients are doing a lot of um, just mm -hmm. self-improvement. They're in the gym. They're working out. They're doing all of that. They're working with a trainer, trying mm -hmm. to get those body composition changes along with surgery. Sure. So what does downtime look like with most surgeries, time frames? So it, it's, and that's a question that I get a lot, you know, we kind of go over in the consults and for most surgeries, I guess a general rule would be you're pretty much off of anything for about two weeks. Mm -hmm. After about two weeks, then it's, it's kind of light exercise, thinking treadmills, um, you know, walking around the block, you know, maybe uh, you know, walking up and down hills, get your mm -hmm. heart rate up a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but really six weeks is kind of the cutoff for intense exercise. I tell, okay. you know, tell a lot of patients, whether it's tummy tucks, breast surgery, facelift surgery, typically no lifting and no bouncing for six weeks. Okay. And then, no bouncing. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> of any kind. Of any kind. <laughs> of any, Stay off the trampoline. Yeah. Yeah. You, 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 what, you know, you determine what bouncing is yeah. for you. Right? So, you know, but um, but yeah, it's, it's so six weeks out of the gym for sure. Mm -hmm. But you're you're you know, I want patients to be up and moving the day of surgery. That you know there isn't laying around is mm -hmm. where your complications happen. Mm -hmm. And so up and moving to a point for someone that's getting a facelift or doing fat grafting into the cheeks mm -hmm. or into the face. How soon can they do laser resurfacing after surgery? It, great question. It, it's a good, really good question. It, so it depends on what else is done. Injections typically do laser resurfacing same time. Yeah, where perfect. you, yeah, where you, you the, the tricky part is with a facelift. And because you don't want to, you have to lift the skin up to mm -hmm. reposition the muscles and do all mm -hmm. the work that's needed to get the result. And you don't want to stress the skin by lifting it up and then set it back down and blast mm -hmm. it from the top with mm -hmm. a laser. And so you have to be really careful over that skin that has been elevated. Mm -hmm. And so it's a matter of matching the right procedure. You know, if we're doing a deep plane facelift, that is typically really limited skin undermining, of, you know, above the jawline. Okay. And so I can be more aggressive with laser resurfacing doing that is if we're doing a smaller facelift that, with less muscle tightening, mm -hmm that relies on a little bit more skin undermining. Okay, gotcha. To get what about result. treatment for scars? How quickly for um, treating with either creams or lasers for scars post-surgery? Really, almost after the, the tape has come off. Love it. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, it Love is it. right mm -hmm. after, you know, because that you're looking, That's you know, scar is essentially healed less than a week. If it's, okay. you know, if the skin edges are put together right, you know, that skin has healed over in about 48 hours. We want to let it kind of thicken. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, once that tape comes off, whether it's a week or two weeks, you can start after it. laser <laughs> treatments mm -hmm. right then. I love it. But again, mm -hmm. talk yeah. to your surgeon yeah. before <laughs> lasering yeah. a surgical I'm like, you got to throw that caveat yeah. out there <laughs> always. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. we just, that's what they just said. We were a little mm -hmm. surprised at the most recent conference we're at. They're like, as soon as everything's off. And we're like, yeah. it seems so real. Even so like quick. vaginal yeah. treatments are like yeah. the day the baby comes out. I'm like, what? Like in other well, countries. They were yeah. talking about more also stretch marks. Yeah. Like, so if you have stretch marks, as soon as you deliver, <laughs> come on, get on, you know, because they're darker at that point yeah. in the, the ribeye versus, yeah. you know, a scar tissue once it's white. So, yeah. Stretch marks are tough, though. Mm -hmm. I mean, stretch yeah. marks are tough to treat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. But we have, I think that we have some things for that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I think that like just the, the fractional like mm -hmm. erbium yep. is really good as it, if sooner the better. Yeah. yeah, yeah, fractional erbium, ones. and then and then you know for the for the the purples or reds, mm -hmm. you, know, yeah. you can you can zap those. Yeah, you know, much with, much more responsive. Yeah. Too. Yes, yeah, so much better than the white. 
Yeah. Old. Yeah. Once they're white, you're, yeah. you're, you're, you're in for kind of the long haul to get yeah. that oh, yeah. to improve. <laughs> what about with the fat transfers? Is the fat transfer, when you do it, is that, like, how long does that procedure take? Is that an in-office procedure? Is there a lot of downtime with that um, versus, like, a surgical? So it, it really, it depends on what we're treating. Um, if we're treating a small area, um, even treating an area like the backs of the hands, those are good in-office procedures. When we start talking about full face rejuvenation with fat, um, it tends to be a little bit more involved. I like to do those in the operating room. The, the procedure length, if I'm doing it in, you know, in our surgery center, which is right below my office, a full face fat grafting session can take 45 minutes or an hour. Okay. It's, it's not okay. a lengthy procedure. Um, in the office, it tends to take a little bit longer just because you're awake. We want to make sure you're comfortable. We're, things mm -hmm. are a lot slower because we're making sure that every little area is properly anesthetized before we do anything. Mm -hmm. um, the real recovery with fat transfer is not pain. It's swelling. Because yeah. fat is, as you guys know, fat is very inflammatory. Mm -hmm. And so especially in thinner areas, so under the, around the eyes, mm -hmm. um, around the mouth, the lips especially, mm -hmm. they tend to really swell. And so you have to budget. I tell people, you know, give yourself two weeks wow. before okay. you're really out in public because you'll be noticeably swollen. swollen. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. So it sounds like almost if you're going to do a decent area, the operating room is the better place to be for those procedures. It, it's, it's, it's much more, more comfortable. Yeah. It, it's just more comfortable. Um, and I know some people and that's are... a huge part of it yeah. when these mm -hmm. are all, you mm -hmm. know, extra. Nobody has to. They're elective, yeah. right? We yeah. want everybody to be comfortable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's surgery you want, not surgery you need. Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. So the operating room is, is kind of my preferred venue. But if you know, if a patient wants to and is... You have to have the right temperament. If you're an anxious person, you know, <laughs> having, you know, facial fat grafting in the office when you're awake is not the right procedure. And I think even like yeah. you're doing all procedures, all operations on at an independent um, surgery center. So like more control over even anesthesia and right and patients, you know, entering and leaving and much more private um, as circumstance than at a hospital right. based. Right. Yeah. So our, our office, I'm very fortunate that my office is directly above the surgery center. And the only thing that the entire building does is cosmetic plastic surgery. So we have the same OR team. We've got the same team of, of anesthetists. We've got the same nurses at the same building. That's all every we day. do yeah. every day. And so we've really, over time, taken great pains to make the entire experience from kind of start to finish as comfortable, private. I mean, you're not going to run into your friends or, mm -hmm. you know, we see a lot of nurses, a lot of healthcare mm -hmm. providers, physicians, and they don't want to run into yeah. their friends right. as they're asleep <laughs> and half naked and you well, know, having cosmetic go, surgery. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Correct. Or go, or to, go to the hospital. A yeah. separate <laughs> registration area. And then you're in a waiting room that's public. And so yeah. there's so many downsides to doing it yeah. at a hospital based. Yeah, it, it's really surgery. it's really been a been a fantastic setup. That's awesome. Yeah. So I love it. No, I knew that was a huge advantage, like yeah. big yeah. advantage. Because yeah. a lot of patients, and again, just like you said, they want privacy. Yeah. And that hospital experience is anything but. Plus, you're stuck with hospital equipment. Mm -hmm. You're stuck and with hospital guidelines. And hospital guidelines. Mm -hmm. And, you know, mm -hmm. so no requirements. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, you know, in our, our surgery center, to, to speak to that, you know, the surgery center goes through the same accreditation process that the hospital does. Oh, I'm sure. And yeah, so from, from a safety standpoint, from all that is exactly the same. It's just that, you know, the um, administration. Is there we go. Friendly. That was a nice, that was a really nice way yeah. of putting that. That was very PC. Yeah. No, I so. think that in addition, though, I think you have, like, even though you go through the same accreditation process, you probably have better treatment protocols, anesthesia protocols. A little bit more stringent. Like recovery, like things aren't controlled. So likewise. Yeah. That yeah. It's, 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 it's geared towards. Mm -hmm. It's aesthetic patients. Yes, love it. So it's a big difference. Yeah, it mm -hmm. is. It's really been been a fantastic setup. 
That's awesome. So. Well, awesome. So it sounds like we've like covered a ton. I love it. This, yeah, yes. this has been a lot of fun. Yeah, this we're has gonna, been a lot of fun. We're doing this again. Absolutely. Um, Let's do it. For sure. So I thank you so much for being part of this. And, oh, well, thank you. And actually initiating. Like, I love it. Um, that's perfect. We have so much to cover in the future. Like, we can talk about so many different things. Oh, different procedures, things. different, different yeah. lasers, different treatments. Yeah, and I'm we sure. We do whole shows on yes, this. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, we might even, if we're doing like a RevMD, you know, just an open forum, and we need a guy present for, you know, the guy opinion, we'll bring Dr. Totally. Holman, right? Totally. Yeah. 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 He'll let us know, for sure. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Well, good. Well, again, listen, subscribe, share with friends, leave some comments or even your experience or questions. And we're willing to deep dive into anything wellness and aesthetics. And thank you, Dr. Hall and Faraday for making this such an interesting uh, segment and podcast. It's been wonderful. So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you both.